Navigating our roads is a shared responsibility amongst drivers, bicyclists, and pedestrians. Each year, there are dozens of deadly crashes followed by recurring calls to make our streets safer. This year alone, there have been more than 10 pedestrian fatalities across the state. Speed humps, raised crosswalks, and red light cameras are being installed. But is it enough? Tonight's live broadcast and live stream of insights on PBS Hawaii start now. Aloha and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Daryl Huff. August is Pedestrian Safety Month and unfortunately our roads can be dangerous to navigate on foot. This year there have been 15 pedestrian fatalities across all four counties. That number does not include pedestrians who have been injured in a crash and survived. There are a number of factors that could contribute to a crash including speeding, low visibility and inattentive behavior for both drivers and pedestrians. We're asking our panel tonight if there's a way to reduce pedestrian fatalities in Hawaii. We look forward to your participation in tonight's show. You can email or call in your questions and you'll find a live stream of this program at pbshawaii.org and the PBS Hawaii Facebook page. Now to our guests. Ben Moskowitz is the Chief of the Hawaii, uh, chief of the Hawaii Police Department. He's, I'm so used to him being at HPD. <laughs> Prior to his appointment, he worked for more than two decades with the Honolulu Police Department, where he most recently served as major in the traffic division. Ed Sniffen is the director of the State Department of Transportation. The agency is responsible for planning, designing, constructing, and operating our state roadways. Prior to this post, he was the deputy director for DOT's Highways Division. Kaylee E. Lopez is the state director for AARP Hawaii. She's been with the nonprofit since 2019. AARP has 150,000 members in Hawaii and focuses on issues that affect people age 50 and over. Yes. <laughs> and Daniel Alexander is the Regional Planning Branch Chief for the City and County of Honolulu's Department of Transportation Services. He's the coordinator for the city's Vision Zero Action Plan, which aims to eliminate fatalities and serious injuries on our roadways. Let me start off with uh, Ed Sniffed. Uh, is there this year, is there a trend in ter terms of the total number or the kind of accidents you're seeing that are leading to pedestrian fatalities? Not necessarily a trend. I mean, what, what we're seeing right now is there's, the trend is following the normal. Um, the, most of the fatalities occur later in the evening or early morning, during the times that, it, that's, that it's dark. Uh, we're seeing a lot of fatalities that are, that are including our homeless population. Uh, of the 15 that we have so far, seven are homeless individuals. And we're seeing um, a lot of the, the fatalities um, resulting from crashes that were started because of lack of awareness, um, lack of visibility uh, in different areas, um, and in some cases, uh, drunk and drug driving. Um, uh, Kelly Lopez from AARP, you know, in the past we've often talked about how elderly uh, folks are um, frequently higher in the statistics than they should be. Is that still true or are we doing a little bit better? No, that is still the case, and part of that has to do with really just having people pay closer attention. So you're going to have kupuna who are taking their grandchildren to to school or, you know, going to doctor's appointments. And so, you know, during the work day, luckily, I think for at least the pedestrian issues, the nighttime part is not so much a, a, a significant issue for kupuna. But just during the day, whether it's crossing the street, uh, walking along a particular area, uh, if there aren't sidewalks or those types of things. So I think it's really getting people, are we doing better? I think there's a lot that the county and the state have been doing uh, that really try to address the issue of speed. In particular, people driving too, too fast, but also as part of that is um, people not paying attention. So some of those things that even if they're, they're there for uh, addressing speed, they also make you pay attention really quick <laughs> once you hit one of them bumps. <coughs> Um, uh, Daniel Alexander with the city and county. Um, this idea that you could actually eliminate uh, injuries and eliminate fatalities, is that really uh, a possibility? So I think Vision Zero is about saying we're going to put safety first above everything else. And that's definitely something we can do. And it's going to, I think, guide us in that direction. Um, there have been places that have actually um, eliminated fatalities on their street. Um, the U.S. is sadly kind of um, unique 
and that we are not tackling this issue the way many developing uh, developing world countries are, where they have been taking actions over the years and seeing their numbers uh, reduced dramatically. And I, I do think there's a lot of actions we can take, some of which are already underway. Um, but yeah, there's the, we, we can make it a long way in that direction. And I think we can go through a lot of the specific ideas as we move a little along further into the show. Um, Chief Moskowitz, uh, you know, f from your experience, what's having your experience of many years here in uh, Honolulu and now what you've seen in the Big Island, is there a difference between the, the neighbor islands issues with this and uh, Honolulu's issues? I think you hit the nail on the head a few moments ago when you talked about speed. Um, you know, from a statistical standpoint, uh, cars that are traveling 20 miles an hour and hit a pedestrian, the pedestrian is 10% likely to, to die as a result of the collision. If you get up to 30%, it goes to 25 Oh, 30 miles an 30 hour. miles an hour goes to 25 percent 40 miles an hour we're at 50 percent and you get to 60 miles an hour and the likelihood is in the 90s that the pedestrian is going to suffer i'm surprised that. it's that low <laughs> that speed right and well there's always there are always unique factors in either direction right. right a very low speed crash could end in a fatality if the person has an unguarded fall or their head hits a curb i mean there, there's always factors but if, if you want to look at reducing fatalities neighbor islands statewide nationwide um, Car speeding in close proximity to pedestrians is a huge low-hanging fruit. You know, um, as, as the traffic major and now as the chief, you're, you are often in the position where you actually have to tell people that someone has passed from a, an accident. What is that like? And you, you, are there any stories you'd like to share with me that are particularly bring to mind the tragedy of someone dying on the road? Oh, it's heartbreaking. <laughs> uh, telling someone that they've lost a loved one is, is probably the absolute worst part of our job. Um, you know, I, I, I don't even really want to tell you any of those stories because of just the, the emotion that it, that it would probably force you to have to deal with here on live TV. Um, but well, that's my job. Right, well, I know, I know. Uh, but that, I, the first time an officer goes to a case where there's a fatality as a result of a motor vehicle collision, whether it be a pedestrian or an occupant or a bicyclist, motorcycle operator, um, for a lot of us, that, that flips a switch. Uh, and, you know, you... You kind of devote yourself and you dedicate yourself to doing whatever it is possible, whether it be public advocacy, coming to talk on insights about how important it is to raise community awareness, or whether it be that you're going to become that enforcement person who's going to do their best. You know, Kaylee, I saw you sort of cringe at that, but I, I was thinking myself as a, as a reporter, the times I've actually had to go to a scene early. It used to be we'd hear a scanner and here's a case, you go and you're like nearly first on the scene. You realize how fragile a human being is. Absolutely, and you know, I think his point about an officer or firefighter, whoever, is first on the scene for any kind of, uh, you know, again, traffic fatality, um, that I can see why one would want to become an advocate or look to try to do something after seeing such a significant impact on individuals, uh, if not worse, even their families. My father was a firefighter, and I heard a lot of stories about people being in car accidents and the challenges related to that. Um, and so I'm glad you're doing this show because I think it's so important. Be As everyone here knows, a lot of those, those accidents are preventable. Yeah. I mean, and we got to be able to do more to do that. So. You know, I know, um, Ed Sniffen, you, you've been a big advocate for engineering safety into roads as opposed to enforcing speed, although that's also part of the mix. Um, how much emphasis is there? How much of a priority do you have in your department, for example? You've got a lot of fires to deal with. You've got roads falling into the ocean. You've got huge highway projects. You've got huge maintenance. How do you fit in adding safety to existing roads and stuff? <clears throat> safety is the priority I mean, in everything we do. Uh, we, we work on capacity projects. We, we make sure that our system is resilient. Uh, we make sure that we upgrade the maintenance of our system daily. And in all of those things we do, safety is the top priority. And yet, you had asked a question to Daniel before about whether or not we can actually get to, to zero. Uh, answer is absolutely we have to. Uh, when we start talking about the, the number of fatalities we have every year, 60, 63 is huge already. Uh, 75 was even bigger last year, so I'm happy. Oh, sorry, 78 last year was big, but I'm happy we at least saved those 15 lives. For me, the, the zero is a must because those numbers that I'm talking about are just numbers until you know somebody mm -hmm. that, got, that was killed. Once you know a person that was killed, um, it, if it affected your family, uh, your friends and the like, 
very difficult for you to consider any number other than zero. But I'm, I'm a realist. I know that I cannot go to zero tomorrow, but we can have zero tomorrow. Then hopefully another zero the next day. And hopefully we keep continuing those zeros out until we have one for a year. If, um, if nothing else, the zero, I've struggled with this too <clears throat> because uh, like I'm a very statistical data-driven person and it's never going to be zero. It'll never be zero. But what's kind of won me over is the concept that you have to start traveling in a direction, yes. right? And so whether you get to zero tomorrow or you don't get to zero till the day after tomorrow or the day after that, <clears throat> you have to start making roadway improvements and changing behaviors. And in the meantime, it, it might not save everyone immediately, but the people that it saves in the meantime is a huge success. Big time. And when we start looking at that zero or looking at the, fatal the causes of fatalities, speed is the cause. Regardless of what caused the crash, speed caused the fatality. So in all the infrastructure that we start putting in, we're making sure that we're managing speed. We love our law enforcement partners, but we know they cannot be everywhere in the system all the time. We just know it. So we want to make sure that we put together a system that has safeguards in place to ensure that we can manage speed where we see the need for it. And I appreciate Ed's point of <laughs> zero every day. Uh, so that it, it must be possible because there are days when it is zero. Um, and being able well, to have that, yeah, zero. or most <laughs> days it is zero. So why not work to see that and, and see that vision zero is probably something that's very, is a tangible result and we got to work at it. Now, thing for Daniel, now one of the things that I think people kind of get confused about is that they, they say government makes the roads, but there are city roads and there are state roads. On the city roads, which are more of the residential roads, there are boulevards and so on. Are you folks working on that to, to get people, get these roads safer, particularly the congested roads, or the busy roads, um, the heavily parked roads in, this, in the suburbs and stuff like that? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, the city, like you said, it's mostly the local roads, but a lot of the bigger streets, like King Street, for example, is a, is a city street. And um, so it's a little less, not necessarily this year, but historically it's a little less than half of the pedestrian fatalities are on city streets. So it's, it's really a, an island-wide issue. Um, but, you know, we're doing a variety of things. One thing is that we're trying to do, you know, makeovers, complete makeovers of streets. We call it complete streets planning. Um, when we did our Oahu pedestrian plan, uh, we identified what we called our high, high pedestrian injury corridors. Mm. And it's two miles of street or 40 miles of street, 2% of all of our streets, that accounts for 60% of our pedestrian fatalities over really? the last decade. Okay, so, so this that, very that actually makes it a manageable uh, uh, target. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we have complete streets plans for a number of them. I'll just give an example. And Kaneohe uh, Kamehameha Highway um, is gonna be made over when it's uh, repaved. We, we tag along with the project's opportunities. Uh, one of the critical intersections there at Bahia Road, uh, we're going to have a rectangular rapid flashing beacon put in because there's a history of pedestrian safety issues. Um, you know, we're <laughs> since we're uh, let's talk a little bit more about enforcement uh, since we have the chief here too. And uh, when you talk about speed, and you, you say you can't have a police officer on every corner, but even if you gave out, if you were on every corner and you gave out all the speeding tickets you want. Is the system hard enough on people who are chronic speeders? We, we did the story ourselves at Hawaii News Now about the, uh, that when that, that, that unfortunate teenager passed away on Kapilani Boulevard and uh, that guy had incredible number of, uh, un, of speeding tickets and never seemed to pay the price for it. I mean, are we getting better at that or should we get better at that? Does that make a difference? Oh, sure. That's that's a whole other three hour program in and of itself. Um, well, we've got a few minutes. <laughs> yeah, no, let's go. Uh, so enforcement is as good as stopping action and behavior immediately unless there's some sort of deterrent effect, right? So for example, if you are, if I am on the H1 freeway and I'm headed townbound and I'm going through Pearl City and I'm coming up to uh, the airport viaduct, uh, what, is, what happens? People change out of the left lane, they slow down to 55, 60 miles an hour. Why? Because more often than not, historically, there's a solo bike officer mm -hmm. sitting on the left-hand side. I know where cars, they are. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Correct. But what happens in those areas? You slow down, mm -hmm. right? That, so that has a deterrent effect because there's a realistic expectation <laughs> that something bad could happen to mm -hmm. you, whether it's true or not. Even if you think it might be a holiday and they might not be working, you still slow down. So uh, enforcement can change behavior, but enforcement is also not the panacea. I can imagine, I, not I can imagine, I can remember um, a, a, 
a case where a pedestrian was struck and killed on Nimitz Highway right over here, Mokowea Puuhale Road. Um, and when we, uh, the traffic investigators went to the morgue and we, you know, we conduct our investigation, uh, in the pedestrian's pocket is a citation for jaywalking from an hour before the crash. So it, it, it's not a magic bullet. It, it's really good at changing large groups of people's behaviors, and that's, I think, the way that we could guide enforcement towards, again, hanging these low-hanging fruits, p picking these low-hanging fruits, in these specifically in these areas where we know there's a high propensity. I, I just wanted to, uh, since I just we just brought it up, uh, uh, this was exactly about that McKinley High School said, what legal system do we have in place to hold repeater repeat offenders accountable. Now, at the police level, you're doing what you can. It goes to courts. It sort of ends up being systemic. I know um, uh, Ed Sniffen, you and I have talked about this. Uh, do you, are we getting better yet at that, the holding repeat offenders accountable? I think we're getting better at highlighting the, the problems in the program or in the system. Um, and, and it's caught the eye of the legislators, which is a big thing. <clears throat> uh, when the speaker comes out and says there's a problem, uh, you know there's going to be legislation next year to make sure that we come on and fix it. And he's been pushing it really hard to ensure that we up this enforcement process. Police are doing everything they can. And we've got to make sure that we follow through uh, through the court system as well. So <clears throat> I, 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 don't, I can't say that we've fixed it, um, but I know that we've, it's identified. It's being worked on now, and we're hoping that we're going to be able to support a lot of good bills coming in the next legislative session. Um, Kelly, uh, there, I've got a number of questions here about... Um pedestrian crosswalks and stuff. And, and do you think that um, we're good enough at protecting crosswalks for, for, for pedestrians in terms of signage, painting? That's, these are the kind of questions I'm getting in here now. You know, I, I think you can put a lot of those things in place, but if drivers do not stop for pedestrians, it's a little bit difficult. I, I don't know whose study it was, uh, but a study was done here in Honolulu where only a certain percentage of drivers actually stopped for pedestrians crossing the cross, you know, it's a state law. I mean, you have to, you're supposed to give the pedestrian the right of way. Um, so I think there are, I've seen multiple um, um, projects put in place, whether, I think there's a sign, I remember um, you talking about that in an article recently where there's, signage that actually lets people know here's what percentage of people are actually stopping for pedestrians so one i think it's critical that people use those pedestrian crossings rather than jaywalking um, you know paying close attention i think one of the things that we assume too possibly as a pedestrian so we got some kuleana on that is when you're crossing make sure the person make sure the driver sees you make sure you're paying attention um, but, you know, I think drivers just have to be so much more aware of the fact that they are dr they're driving a pretty um, large, um, in some cases, regrettably, it can end up being like a weapon. It is a weapon, absolutely. We've seen it over and over again, um, it being used in that manner on purpose nationally. Yeah. Uh, you know, the size of these vehicles, I mean, is it getting, I mean, maybe uh, Chief can also mention this or any of you, um, is the fact that vehicles seem to be getting bigger all the time kind of contributing to increased fatalities or deaths um, in the roads? Anybody want to just... Absolutely. I mean, if you look at the, the vehicles the way they're built, um, they're built to protect the people inside of it. Um, vehicles are getting bigger and higher. Um, in the past, if a vehicle had hit you, in general, it would be hitting you in the lower portion of your body. Now, when you're impacted, um, chances are you're going to be hitting the upper portion of your body. For survivability goes down quite a bit. Vehicles are heavier now, and mass, um, at, including the, the speed that you're going at, um, decreases the survivability, so definitely. You know, um, I'm just going to read a couple of questions that kind of goes to that. Drivers need to be retrained and retake a test every two years. Um, is your sense, uh, uh, Chief, I want to call you Ben, Chief, that... <laughs> That's my name, I'm that, good. That, that, that <laughs> drivers tend to get lackadaisical, you know, and maybe something like that would uh, make them re-educate themselves? I think people understand what the rules are, right? So if you were to take a test every two years when you got your driver's license and the question was, should you stop for a pedestrian in a crosswalk, I, I think you'd have a really high success rate. Um, it, it's how that knowledge, though, translates into action on the road. Right? And when you add in things like being distracted and traveling above the speed limit uh, and impairment, 
either on the path of the driver and or the pedestrian. Um, on Hawaii County, we see a substantial number of our pedestrian fatalities where the pedestrians have uh, narcotics and other drugs in their blood system. So without playing a blame game, who's at fault, that, that's not the point of the, the conversation. It's how do we kind of guardrail this back? And I think it's not, I, I doubt that it's a knowledge-based issue. Let me, uh, I've got, I'm getting a lot of questions about crosswalks. Some of them are about what the law is. Uh, cars don't respect crosswalks and street signs and speed through without checking for pedestrians. Can we put up cameras to monitor busy crosswalks? Ed Sniffen is smiling like, <laughs> like uh, uh, you, you guys have got that program. Um, how much of that was for the, uh, was about pedestrians or is about pedestrians? It's for everybody. Uh, the red light, we're talking about the red light camera program. Yeah, so the red light um, safety camera program was for everybody at, at intersections. The whole intent is to make sure that if we can, if we can make people follow the law at those red lights, we protect uh, pedestrians that are, are crossing and vehicles that are crossing as well. Everybody gets protected if everybody follows the rules. We would love to expand it, but right now we only have a pilot that allows us for 10 intersections in one court district. As soon as that, that pilot is done and after, last, uh, after the two years, we'll make a recommendation to, to our legislature to hopefully give us the, um, the, the green the, light. Yeah, the green light to go <laughs> statewide. <laughs> so, so when is that? What is the timeline on that then? When is the two years up? End of next year. Is this fast enough for you? For me, no. I mean, I would love to expand it as soon as possible, but I totally understand the situation. Um, there, um, if we go back to Van Cam, when we had a system in place that tracked speeds and enforced, um, a, lot, a lot of people saw it as, as unfair, um, mainly because they got tickets. Uh, but if you look at the, uh, the safety records during that time frame, safety went up. If you look at uh, compliance to, to yielding to pedestrians, went up. All of those things that, that go through your mind when you, when you know there's a blue light at the next corner, um, all those considerations that you make in driving safely all went up, which was a good thing. Now, that being said, I don't disagree that it was unfair that we were paying a vendor to, to issue tickets. I don't agree that it was unfair that um, these cameras could be any place. Well, a big yeah. part of the problem, too, was that the county <laughs> didn't want the program. It was imposed and it was forced the state to check, per, pick certain places that had a certain speed limit, and, and they were there all the time. So the same drivers, you remember all that, Yeah, right? I totally agree. Uh, but I think now everybody's aligned. I well, think all the countries are Daniel all aligned. Alexander, what's the city's position on this kind of technology-based uh, enforcement? Um, where are you guys with, with that? Do you, do you favor expansion well, I, of it, maybe even speed cameras, that kind of stuff? So uh, we, the city has been participating and a partner um, in the red light safety cameras, and I think it's a really important thing to, to address safety. I mean, as, as much as our police officers do a lot of good work, they can't be everywhere, and uh, a camera can provide that constant enforcement. I think to Ed's point, too, and tying in what I said earlier, we have a sense of where our biggest problems are, um, I'm sure on, on Hawaii County they do as well. And if we had additional automated enforcement in those areas, not just at the red lights, but also um, speed enforcement, we could really tackle those issues because um, speed is such a consequential variable in, in um, just about all the crashes. I know you're a real uh, student of what happens in other places. You, you've been active in learning about what's worked in other places. Have speed cameras focused on certain areas really succeeded in lowering speeds, increasing safety in other places? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, you know, if you look at maybe another, another country like Australia or New Zealand, um, they've really aggressively put in speed cameras and it allows them to regulate speeds in more rural areas where they couldn't uh, conceivably have enforcement all the time. And th their numbers on a national level have been dropping. They've, uh, in Australia, they've more than half their numbers in the last 20 years. Okay, I've got some. Can I just good, add one please. thing? Yes. I mean, so the issue with the cameras, but even uh, um, we were talking earlier about the raised um, sidewalks. So we're talking about cr pedestrian crossings. Those sidewalks slow cars down, and it, for people, I understand that they're like, it's an inconvenience, but your inconvenience saving someone's life is worth it. And I think that's the way we've got to look at the issue of, you know, pedestrian safety. Because one of the things that we think about f at, at ARP is Kupuna shouldn't have to cross their fingers 
to cross the, you know, mm. go across the street in a crosswalk safely. Uh, so it, it shouldn't be, uh, it shouldn't be such a challenge. I mean, it's, it, it, it really, um, so anyway, uh, no, just no, no, to no, no, I, I'm add just, that on I'm there. I'm just beginning to realize no, how many questions people, I'm getting. Yeah. So much of what we get is where people think, are complaining about it being inconvenient for them they, on their way to work, but the degree to which you might save someone's life is like, Come on. The inconvenience is only an inconvenience if you're going faster than you're supposed to. Exactly. At the speed limit, you guys have done a really great job. You just kind of glide right over. Glide over, exactly. And, and to your point, the, the reason we put in these race crosswalks as, in as many places as we, as we have, it's, it's a low-tech solution. I don't have to worry about power. I don't have to worry about running through processes. It'll work every time. Mm -hmm. do, do people, though, speed up between the humps? I haven't yeah. seen that. So what we've seen, actually, on the data is those humps work. 500 feet before and 500 feet after. So it calms that corridor for about 1,000 feet. Now, if you double them up, or if you put more in, in an area, it magnifies that benefit. So if you look at Kalihi Street, that used to be a raceway coming through that area. We put in six speed humps through those, those areas, or race pedestrian crosswalks through those areas. You don't see those significant speeds through those zones anymore, even between the race pedestrian crosswalks. Yeah, I, I, I drive that almost every day. Um, okay, I'm getting a lot of questions. I'm gonna go through some of them. Um, okay. We, uh, a number of people are asking for clarification on what the rules are around crosswalks. Um, so, uh, Chief, tell me what's the proper way for, so, so we, we had a new root law that was like, eight, maybe not new, eight or nine years ago, when they really started to say, you have to yield to pedestrians in the crosswalk. Sure. Um, and uh, so question from Gene Kaneo, suggestions for how to cross the street as a pedestrian who relies on hearing cars pass by, it's difficult to hear electric cars pass by while crossing, okay. Um, if, if we can reduce pedestrian accidents if pedestrians follow the signal lights, not cross when the countdown has already started, not jaywalk and pay attention to cars. That's Beverly from Makiki. Do pedestrians have to actually be inside or outside the crosswalk for the stoplight to turn red and the car to stop? Okay, I don't quite get that one. Um, but pedestrians don't have an invisibility force field of immunity. They have to look. Um, so give us the latest rules about crossing the, uh, a road and uh, being a vehicle approaching a crosswalk when okay. someone's around. So if you're in a business or commercial district, which is a substantial portion of Oahu, um, the, the way to cross the street is one of two ways, and both of them involve crosswalks. Um, so the term crosswalk is defined in the Hawaii Revised Statutes as one of two things. Either at an intersection where two roads intersect between the sidewalks, where one sidewalk ends and the other sidewalk begins. Now that could be painted, there could be a marking on the ground that designates it as a crosswalk, or it could be unpainted. There are unmarked crosswalks that are crosswalks by definition because that's where the streets come together. The other place is a mid-block crosswalk. So mid-block crosswalks are always marked, they're always painted, um, there are no mid-block unmarked crosswalks, that's called jaywalking. <laughs> so if, you, if you're at an intersection where the sidewalk stops on one side and starts on the other side, technically that's a crosswalk. You know, that is a point that I argue with my wife all the time. <laughs> you're right. And I, <laughs> No, I'm not. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, my right. bad. I should have known. Uh, yeah, I wonder what it's like at your house. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, this this idea of unmarked crosswalks, what does that mean in terms of the law and, and my right as a pedestrian or my right as a driver? Because uh, I live in Makakilo, there are many technically unmarked crosswalks in Makakilo across big streets, like yes, four lane are. streets. Yes, there are, and hopefully we pivot next to Ed, who's gonna tell us why they unmarked some of the marked crosswalks <laughs> at intersections. I know that's a big question as well that we used to get all the time when I was here. Um, technically, 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 uh, you that is a crosswalk, and as a pedestrian, you have the right of way as long as there is not traffic coming, traffic can reasonably stop. Now, I would ask you though, would you rather be right and dead, or would you rather be wait and move towards a For more marked people, crosswalk? that's actually a hard question. <laughs> well. But I mean, right. I, you could be dead right, I guess. So, 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 what does it mean when we talk about reasonable to stop, right? Because if that person's speeding and they're 100 yards away and I start across that intersection and that guy could hit me if he doesn't slow down. So is it okay for me to step out there if it might force the guy to slow down? I would not suggest that. 
I, I want to, I, mean, I want to survive. Yeah, right? exactly. I mean, it, and that's where you kind of have to expect that the <laughs> other party, whether it's you're the pedestrian and you're looking at the driver, or you're the driver and you're looking at the pedestrian. You have to mm -hmm. expect that uh, the other person to do something. You have to watch them. Right? It's like defensive yeah. walking. Right. Oh, to your, to your point, time. you make yeah. eye contact. Right. You big have this time. silent communication where I'm going to cross. Okay, I'm going to slow down. And until you have that, um, you can build all the infrastructure you want, and that again alleviate some of it. But that being aware on both parts is how you're going to get success and you're going to go towards zero. Exactly. Uh, back to the, cross, the countdown. Okay. Okay. So what's the rule when you've got the light there and the hand comes out or the numbers start counting down? So when the numbers are counting down or the hand is blinking, you are not supposed to start crossing the street. You're not supposed to step off the curb. Including if there's a, an intersection where there's an island in the middle. So you can, right, so in Waikiki, some places, um, Ala, Moana, uh, Ala Moana and Ina comes to mind, right? There's kind of an island there by uh, Hilton Hawaii Village. A median. Correct, yes, a little safety-ish mm -hmm. area. Mm -hmm. I will hesitate to use the word, but that's what it's, <laughs> that's what it's called, right? So when the, when the hand is, is white, or that shows a pedestrian, a white, the white pedestrian walking silhouette, it is okay to step off the curb and begin crossing the road. Once the hand starts blinking red or the countdown and or the countdown timer starts, it is illegal to step off the curb and start crossing the road. Okay. Um, another question we got about crosswalks is in, the, in Waikiki, they, you, they, there's a number of now everybody crosses at the same time. Stop all traffic, everybody crosses at the same time. A lot of crabbing about that when it first started from drivers who felt like that, that was too long. How is that going? Um, Daniel Alexander with the, the, those crosswalks. So, so uh, the city implemented the all way or um, sometimes a little barn stance crossing where, like you said, all traffic stops um, and pedestrians can go in any which direction on Kalakaua Avenue on, I believe, six of those intersections some time ago. Uh, but maybe what you're referring to is the uh, state has actually oh, implemented that on Ala Moana okay. Boulevard more recently. Um, yeah, they did a whole brown and Anna on Ala Moana Boulevard. And it's going really well. Um, we've minimized the delay to drivers. There's still some. And we've maximized the safety for pedestrians. So from our perspective, nobody got hit, nobody got killed. It's going really, really well. That being said, we still get complaints from people who are driving through that area. And most of the people who are complaining are those that are cutting through the area to get someplace else not the residents themselves. So you know, the other thing, yeah, the other thing too is that along Alamoana Boulevard, you eliminated a lot of right turns on red, which is very irritating <laughs> for some of us. But um, why, why did you do that and what's the safety factor there? The safety issue on, on that one is, is twofold. And um, shouldn't that be everywhere? Well, everywhere, I don't know. But for a lot of different places, absolutely yes. When we started looking at the safety issues on, for right turners, and, and everybody in this room can attest to this when you see it on the system. When somebody's turning right, they're not looking in front of them at the crosswalk where people would be crossing in front of them. They're not looking right at the crosswalk where other people may be crossing in that area. They're looking left to see if there's a gap in traffic for them to go in. So when they start accelerating through those areas, they put a lot of people at risk, bicycles and pedestrians who are in those crosswalks. We eliminated those rights on reds in areas where we have significant volumes of pedestrians and significant numbers of right turners mm -hmm. to ensure everyone's safety in those areas. Um, ben Moskowitz, uh, Chief, when, when, when one jurisdiction does something like that, one thing I've noticed at some of these intersections is that people who have been making that right turn for years still make that right turn on red like 10 cars in a row will go. I mean, do you folks, uh, is there a collaboration that says, okay, I'm going to do this. Now, can you put some enforcement there so that people believe it? Absolutely. And I think the, the, all the county police departments work very well with, the, with their county DTSs and with the state DOT. And, um, you know, we have collaborative partnerships where we talk about here's the plan in this intersection. And here's what we're going to do. And now, typically, it's, um, you know, we're not going to go out and cite everyone who turns right on red the first day that Ed puts the sign up, that's not fair, right? that's, um, you know, that's not cool. But even if we stop people and remind them, people aren't used to looking for new signs in areas that they're very familiar with, mm -hmm. right? Like Ed said, they're watching pedestrians, they're watching cars, there's a bunch of other things going on and they assume that they know what the infrastructure is and what it, it, it's gonna be what it always has been. Uh, and when you change things, those signs, however visible to people who are not familiar with the area, kind of go unseen at first. So um, a lot of times it's a public safety campaign and it's stopping people to give them warnings before we uh, you know, shift gears and start issuing citations. Um, Daniel Alexander, I got a couple of 
calls about people talking about how in one place or another there's a sign missing, like it got knocked down, it hasn't been replaced, or the crosswalk hasn't been painted in a long time, or it's been weather beaten or whatever. Is there a place that people should call to get that stuff done because rather than calling us? Because oh, absolutely. There's a uh, Honolulu 311 app. Um, that can you can go and report whatever the issue is and you can flag exactly where it was and it puts it on a map. Um, I don't know the number offhand, but there also is a is a city number. Um, but 311 will work? So the, the Honolulu 311 is a great resource for that um, to, to post uh, those sort of issues. You can take pictures. I got to give it to you. That, that thing is fabulous. It's a really good take system. Pictures. Uh, it'll geotag the location. It gets sent directly. You choose what your uh, what your issue is. It gets sent right to the right district. This or is what department. website? It's an app. It's an app. Yeah. I'll know it through. It, the, so we always tell the public: the more um, specific your uh, issue is, the better. Because sometimes we'll get a complaint that's you know a whole street or something. And like, well, it's kind of hard to act on it at some level. But if you have that picture in that location and you're you're clear in what you're asking for, it's clear from the pictures. Um, it definitely will get action from the city. Um, stop signs. Um, are, 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 are stop signs effective? I mean, I, that's what I'm kind of wondering about. I mean, uh, again, Kapolei, there's a lot of <coughs> big intersections with stop signs. There's some stop signs that say, oh, stop here for pedestrians, and it's really small, you can't really see it. But I'm just wondering, are, are, are we good at stop signs in this, in this city, in this state? So again, drivers. the rules for a stop sign. We'll cover the rules for the stop sign. So <laughs> stop sign, you need to stop. If there's a line painted on the ground, a stop line, you have to stop before the line. If there's no line, you have to stop at the sign or at the intersection before you enter the intersection. Um, the, the yellow kind of tented uh, signs that are in the middle of the road that have a little red octagon that say stop for pedestrians, um, those aren't really official traffic control devices. Um, they're, they're very good warnings and they're excellent advice and you absolutely should stop for pedestrians. Um, that's less of a stop sign violation and more of a pedestrian right of way kind of violation or, or thing. But to the point, again, it's in the middle of the road. It's something people might not be used to. Uh, certainly when they pop up in neighborhoods and they're in the middle of the road, people see them and people take notice and hopefully that changes behavior. Um, okay, so on the North Shore, there are many places like Waimea Valley where tourists and residents illegally cross the road. Can they build a pedestrian overpass on a high foot traffic area? Ed, pedestrian overpasses, they, you know. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> okay, oh, no. yeah, you're coughing, is that because of the, I mean, do we do enough to get pedestrians out of these dangerous situations? You know, I, I don't think so. I think we, we can do a lot more. Um, if there's people crossing in, in areas that are illegal, there's a reason for it. So we're going to make sure that we start addressing those, those reasons, either directing them to the right areas or providing crossing in those areas that make the most sense for them. Now, I will say, though, <clears throat> anytime we go through a pedestrian, uh, pedestrian overpass that requires an EA that ver is very difficult to get through a lot of times, mainly yeah, because yeah. environmental assessment. Okay. In that environmental assessment, the public gets to weigh in on it, and a lot of people, especially on the North Shore, don't like to see vertical structures coming up and, 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 and taking away their... They're like they're they're lying. They're sight lines. Mm, they're sight lines. Yeah. <clears throat> that being said, we, there, there's issues that we got to address, and sometimes a race cross, um, in a, a, a elevated path is is the right thing to do. You've been doing doing some work with uh, traffic circles. Are we? And maybe Daniel, uh, traffic circles are pretty popular almost everywhere else in the world. Do you see that as as something that could help make roads safer here in Hawaii? So the traffic circle, so there's different scales. Traffic circle is a very small scale. It's like a neighborhood street. And um, the safety benefits of it or roundabout, which is a big version, are, are enormous because essentially you're slowing people down. It's very effective at bringing speeds down. Um, the bigger ones would have a design speed often of 15 or 20 miles an hour. And they also prevent the left turn, the T-bone the crash, because you, you always have, you know, someone would be running into someone that was going the same direction as them. So they're really effective tools, um, particularly because of speed reduction and you reduce the conflicts and you remove some of the most um, serious. So how are, those, how are those going in? How are you planning where to put those? Are, they, are there going to be more coming in in, in the city and county? So the neighborhood traffic circle is something we'd look at kind of on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, generally in neighborhood streets. Um, I don't think the city has installed a roundabout in, in recent years. There are some existing, but I, I know the state has, has installed roundabouts recently. I know that there's one um, in uh, kind of by 
uh, where you come up out of Waipahu and you're going up into the area behind Waikeli Shopping Center, there's a roundabout on uh, uh, Manager's Drive, oh, I yeah. think it is. Uh, that one, it just seems like there's, that's like the only one anywhere. Sorry, sorry I misspoke. Well, like I misspoke. <laughs> we had a recent project um, in Kunia, our uh, Kapuna Loop, uh, where we have, we did install two roundabouts um, on and, and, and loop as part of other improvements. But there's area. not there's not like a, a concerted program to install more of these things. It's just you look at every one individually. So there in Cunia, that was a specific Complete Streets project that looked at Cunia Loop. Um, it did a number of things. We, we did another um, uh, section of it. We did what's called a road diet. It was a four-lane street. Uh, we converted it to one lane in each direction with a center left turn lane, uh, bike lanes. Um, so, you know, when we do a complete streets project, we'd look at the safety needs and what the right tools were. Uh, and how can people lobby to have a complete streets project in their neighborhood? I mean, yeah, you, can, you can reach out to us, you can reach out to the mayor, you can reach out to your, to your elected official. Um, you know, we largely, uh, at the city, we largely follow our rehabilitation of streets program. That's when the street's going to be torn up. And so we try to get ahead of it because that's um, when we're going to get the most cost-effective opportunity to, to improve it. How about DOT? Do you guys have something concerted going, or how does that how does that work? It's generally a case by case. But looking at the roundabout, we we like the option. I mean, we we put it in Kie. It works out really well. People were going through that area for 50 miles an hour, and now it's 18 to 20, which is really good, especially in front of the high school. Uh, we have one coming up in Kahikili on Kahikili Highway at Ekamema Highway at that intersection over there. And we look at it because there's a lot of left turn traffic um, in, and with a lot of high speed, a lot of volume. That's those, those, that's, those are the areas that the round the boats work really, really well for us. It slows the traffic down, but it's also a lot more efficient than a signal. And again, just like the, the race pedestrian crosswalks, they work every time. I don't need power for those roundabouts. It works by, by physics. You just can't blow through them because you can't get through the intersection. Um, how, go ahead. <clears throat> well, one of the things I keep hearing is, you know, there are ways to address this. I mean, at least as it relates to the engineering side, right? Uh, I forget what it is, engineering, education, and enforcement, right? Um, but a big challenge, I think, for the city and the state is funding. You know, I think uh, the degree to which we need to have, because uh, you were talking about, you know, advocating for that at the city, at the state level, is really to get our council members, the mayors, the state legislature to really ste step forward um, to provide funding. You know, uh, Ed and I were talking about this issue of, um, you know, how do you address uh, basically safe streets for Kupuna to Keiki or Keiki to Kupuna? And unless the funds are set up, uh, set up and dedicated to enable uh, folks, you know, people like Ed and, and others to actually begin to make these improvements. We've seen them already be successful. So let's just do more. I don't know that you need to have a whole lot more questions around does a raised sidewalk work? Does a turnabout work? They're, these are all known. Let's get it done. You know, I'm wondering, um, I've gotten a couple of questions about kids. For example, more high school students are taking the local bus rather than the school bus. There's a safety concern about increased crossing around schools, especially rowdy students. That's by definition students. Um, this is Joan from Maui. Uh, do we have a lot of, like we talk about fatalities, but do we have a lot of minor pedestrian accidents around schools? Or around where kids are? What's your experience with that? We do, um, and they, again, when you're dealing with kids at Keiki and Kopuna, that's when the, the, the risk factor goes up, Depends. right? Um, because they're either inexperienced or um, very experienced. I'll <laughs> finish that sentence. Well, they might not, they might not be as, as aware of the Correct. circumstances around very them good. or able to perceive Very good. And well. just yeah. physically, there are differences, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the things that Ed has done, I think, and again, to his credit, is um, they've looked at elementary schools uh, on Oahu, and they've put in, I know you don't use the term speed humps, but I like it, uh, <laughs> raised pedestrian crosswalks uh, around those particular areas. And that was a direct uh, request from the, from DOE to the police department here on Oahu, and that went to Ed, and instantly they, they started planning and coming up with a punch list, and those things got installed. So 
Um, that, that absolutely is a, a factor and something that goes into the thinking when it comes to put, where do we put this enforcement and this engineering. But if we start looking at non-fatal accidents, do you know statistically are there a lot of non-fatal accidents that are tracked and go into your data to make decisions about where you should put stuff? Yeah, so we track both fatalities and major crashes. Major crashes are any crash that results in an injury or $3,000 worth of damage to a vehicle or to property. So all of those crashes are tracked as well. We map them throughout the system, work with our law enforcement side and, and the counties to make sure that we track them throughout the system so we have all of that, those data points to consider where best to put uh, mitigative measures to have the highest impact. Is that stuff um, online or is it available? So yes. you can go online and find it? And Absolutely, on our website. Uh, so we, we put up all fatalities that we've had throughout the, uh, throughout the state for the last seven years on our website. Um, and I think we have our major crashes up as well. I can check, but if we don't have it up, we'll make sure we have it up um, within this month. And then do, do you, I know that after the Kapilani um, Boulevard, the I, I'm sorry, I wish I could remember her name, the, the young Sariaro. Yeah, I mean, that was so heartbreaking. And there was a, a definite talk about let's take a look at our schools in, in particularly in Honolulu and see what we can do. Has there been progress in, 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 in getting to a lot of schools and catching up on perhaps engineering or signage or improvements there? Yeah, it's certainly a focus for us and um, as, as you uh, probably many are aware, uh, thanks to DOT there's now two speed humps um, in the vicinity of Kamake on Kapiolani Boulevard mm -hmm. uh, where, where Sarah was, was killed. Um, I, I know we're currently working with DOT and um, under their race crossing program to Pensacola Street, which is on the, the other side of McKinley High School. Mm -hmm. um, it has four um, uncontrolled crosswalks. Uh, they're marked, but they don't have any signal or anything. Um, and they don't meet our current standards, but we know there's a lot of people crossing there. We have a longer term plan to upgrade them, um, but we're working now with DOT to put in uh, race crossings in the near term um, to, to improve that safety really uh, tremendously. Um, here's an interesting question. Many e-bikes, e-scooters, I've noticed this as well, um, and one-wheelers ride in crosswalks and put pedestrians at risk. E-vehicles don't belong on pedestrian walkways. Cynthia in Honolulu, um, decent question. Uh, Chief, what's the rules? I mean, where are they allowed to be? Where are they not supposed to be? Um, there's a lot of different vehicles in that little list, but I mean, and what direction are they supposed to go if they are on the sidewalk? Sure, so the, the state law is different from the county law, so I'm pretty sure there's a county specific ordinance that I am not gonna be able to call. <laughs> not, but not, you remember it a little was confusing because Correct. like in some places you could go on the sidewalk and some places you couldn't. Correct, so com business and commercial districts, it's illegal to ride your bicycle on a sidewalk. Um, you're supposed to ride on the street in the flow of traffic unless you're in a protected bike lane um, and uh, the rest of these vehicles, mopeds, uh, some of them are considered mopeds because the law has not maybe developed as quickly as the technology and the use cases. So uh, some of these devices are maybe considered bicycles if they're human powered, uh, or they may be considered mopeds if they're not human powered. The problem there is that the state is not equipped or nor probably should it reasonably license or regulate some of these vehicles because they're not safe for operation on the, on the county roads or on the state roads. Okay, so, um, I'm sorry, I don't go very many places anymore, so I have my <laughs> areas around where I live and where I work. Uh, you know, I, find, I see I see small electric bikes with young kids speeding up and down on the sidewalks. I mean, electric bikes, they're fast. They may or may not have a helmet. Um, and then there's old people walking on those roads and stuff. I mean, maybe, Ed, you could help me. What? What are we doing about about this? I think it's kind of getting to be a growing issue, and you want people to use these things because you want them out of their cars. But so, where are we with that? Yeah, those so, issues. So, micro mobility is a big thing. Um, micro mobility. Yeah, and well. electric scooters, electric bikes. That's those are those pieces that get people a little bit further along the process. In general, <clears throat> if somebody is within 15 minutes of their destination in whatever mode they're traveling, it's considered a viable mode of transportation. Walking and biking can be extended with an electric scooter or electric bike to get you to that 15 minute sweet spot. Mm -hmm. So it's, a, it's an important piece of the transportation system, especially if we wanna make sure we get people out of their cars. That being said, <clears throat> as Ben had talked about, the, the laws really haven't caught up with the, te the technology. 
Uh, we've passed state laws that identify what a, like where an electric scooter should be, um, what an electric scooter should be, but not where it should be yet. Each of the counties are adopting their own ordinances on where it should be operated. That all being said, <clears throat> whether it's in law or not, um, everybody should understand. If you're, if you're a pedestrian, just know that you should be aware regardless if you're on the sidewalk or on the street. Just got to be aware. Um, definitely enjoy yourself in, in, this, in your surroundings, but understand there are electric scooters out there. There are electric bikes out there that may or, not be, may or may not be in the areas that they're supposed to be. So just pay, pay attention to where you're going uh, throughout the system. I, uh, Joel in Hilo writes, as a kid growing up in Hilo, I was taught whether you're walking or riding your bike, if you argue with a 5,000 pound vehicle, guaranteed you're gonna lose. <laughs> so I always deferred to cars whether I have a right of way or not. Good advice. <laughs> Um, but here's another question. Um, the United States driving laws are too lax. The fines and punishments are too lenient. I support stronger enforcement like in Singapore or England where cars are impounded for traffic violations. Anthony in Honolulu. Uh, Chief, I mean, you're the enforcement guy. Should, should we be tougher? Do you think that would work? If you, I don't know about seizing cars. We have, that's a big, a lot of times people aren't driving their own cars that they own, of course but being really big, tough, slam them with the book kind of punishment. So I'll give you an example. So we have, when I was in Honolulu, we used to set up pedestrian uh, safety enforcement operations. I didn't want to use the word trap because it's really <laughs> not. But essentially what we do is we would go to a, a, a city street where the speed limit is 30 or 35 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. And based on a two-second reaction time and an average vehicle stopping distance, we know, based on NHTSA data, how far back you would have to begin to stop for a pedestrian in the crosswalk. And we would have the pedestrian uh, is, a, is an officer wearing bright colored clothing, and there would be other officers sitting nearby watching. And as long as the car was before the cone that we had marked off, pre-marked off that distance, the officer would step out into the roadway. And if the car stopped, they got to keep going. If they didn't stop, then the officers would pull them over and cite them. Um, we had to stop doing it because of the number of complaints we got. So I, I think complaints from whom? From people who saw us doing it, uh, who thought it was unsafe. From people who got cited. From prosecutors. From the judiciary. Um, what were the prosecutors and judiciary complaining about? If something isn't going to be accepted by the majority of the community. Until you can change that metric and change. So it was like that entrapment. They that's thought it was that's entrapment? the allegation, right? I'm I didn't sorry. say I agreed with it. <laughs> I'm, I'm just trying to give you an example of what you could make the fines a thousand dollars for traffic citations. But if you can't get the judicial system to convict people and hold them accountable and make them pay the thousand dollars, if people think it's unreasonable, then it's it's your good. When you hear circle. stories like this, Kelly, what goes through your mind? <laughs> uh, I just shake my head. Uh, again, we get back to this issue of the degree to which it's inconvenient for people to have to stop for a pedestrian, to have to um, make their way over a speed hump or whatever you want to call it, do a turnabout. Um, <clears throat> you know, in the end, it's really all about what we've all been talking about. It's safety. And our caring for one another has to extend not just to who our neighbors are, but out on the streets and, and understanding that Again, the truth of the matter, too, is I think for people who speed or in, involved in those things, I think I, I would imagine that once you hit someone, you know, your life has changed. You know, yes, absolutely, the person who perhaps ha was in a fatal situation or, you know, died or, you know, injured, but the driver must similarly be impacted by that and my thing is why would you want to expose yourself to that why would you want to be in that situation and I think the degree to which you have programs like this educating people uh, having you know mechanisms in place to address that it's important I just um, I guess it's just it seems like so common sense um, to to do what you can to help protect each other. Have you thought, um, Ed Sniffen uh, from DOT, you guys know where these cases are, you, you see them, you track them. Has you ever had thoughts to um, actually making people go on television or tell their stories? I mean, I know you've probably done traffic safety campaigns, but 
that point that she's making, you know, your life, you, you bump into somebody, your life's going to change. Absolutely. And, you know, for, for the victims, I would hate to have them relive it. And so I've, ne I've never asked that. Um, I'm happy to see when they go out, when the, fa the survivors of fatalities like this go out and talk, tell their stories about it. <clears throat> it really has a resounding effect on everyone. Um, Sarah Yora's mom was so courageous and just, just took it on and made change. The strength that she, Ed Werner, people Ed like Warner. them have, mm -hmm. amazing, absolutely crazy. So I, would, I love when they tell their stories. I never ask it because I, don't, I just don't like seeing them relive it. Well, this has been a really good show. I really appreciate all of you, uh, and we appreciate you folks at home for joining us, and we thank our guests, Hawaii Island Police Chief Ben Moskowitz and Kelly E. Lopez from AARP Hawaii, State Director of Transportation Ed Sniffen, and Daniel Alexander from Honolulu's Department of Transportation Services. There's no insights next week, but we will be having a 90-minute town hall on Hawaii's preparedness for natural disasters. Lahaina's deadly wildfire tragedy has broken our hearts and tested our resolve, but hurricanes and tsunamis are equal threats. Join us next week for Kako, Are We Really Ready for a Natural Disaster? Please join us then. I'm Daryl Huff for Insights on PBS Hawaii. Aloha. Broadcasts of Insights on PBS Hawaii are made possible by the support of viewers like you. Mahalo and by First Insurance Company of Hawaii, protecting Hawaii's families and businesses since 1911. Ulupono Initiative, building a more sustainable Hawaii by investing in local food, renewable energy, clean transportation, and waste and freshwater management. Hawaiian Electric, helping residents and businesses prepare for hurricane season. Visit hawaiianelectric.com safety to get your emergency preparedness handbook. Carl Smith Ball, providing legal services throughout Hawaii and the Pacific since 1857, making a positive difference in the communities where we